حميم تنزيل الكتاب من الله العزيز الحكيم ما خلقنا السماوات والأرض وما بينهما إلا بالحق إلا بالحق وأجل مسمى Assalamu alaikum, my friends. Welcome to another episode of the Revelation Audio Experience. Today we are diving into the third section of the prologue. And in um, this section, what we're going to do is just do a brief overview of what was going on in Arabia prior to the birth of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So the Prophet Muhammad, we believe, was born in um, 570 common era. So let's talk about what was happening in the 400s, 500s, 600s in and around Arabia, and specifically talking about what were the religious practices and beliefs at that time, which is P3.1. And then P3.2, we're going to be talking about what were the political um, powers, the empires surrounding the Quraysh, surrounding Mecca at that time. And finally, P3.3, we're going to take a deeper dive and talk about uh, the Abyssinian uh, Empire and the Yemeni attack on Mecca. So let's dive into P3.1 today, talking about the religions in and around Mecca. We're going to be talking about paganism, Zoro Zoroastrianism, Judaism, Christianity, and Hanifism. Let's start with paganism. So it's very important to understand what happened in Arabia, what happened in Mecca and the outlying areas after Ibrahim al-Islam brought monotheism to the area, right? Remember, Ibrahim al-Islam and Ismail al-Islam, we heard the dua in the Quran, we heard how he established, he prayed to Allah, and he was commanded to establish this Kaaba that he made as a a beacon of monotheism, right? A place of congregation, annual hajj, and so forth to celebrate uh, Allah and to celebrate and commemorate the Ibrahim al Islam's you know, sacrifices and, and so forth, and to establish monotheism in the land. Well, what happened after that? If you remember, the Jurhamites took control over, and then the Khuzaites took control over. The leader of the Khuzaites brought Hubal, that, that statue from Syria. He brought that idol and he put it into the Kaaba. And slowly over time, you know, once you have that first chip, then it starts chipping away real fast. And then before you know it, the Kaaba has turned into a pantheon of all sorts of idols. And when you ask the Quraysh, why are you praying to these idols? They would say, oh, these are our intercessors to Allah. So remember, these aren't people who are just, you know, animists who have no concept of Allah. These are people who know about Allah. It is in their tradition. All of these pilgrimage rites are in their tradition. And so they must have this vague idea of that there is a greater God, but they're using now all of these idols to, um, to intercede for them on behalf of God. So not only did they have Hobal in Mecca, there were three other sister idols, as they were called, that were brought into various outlying um, settlements outside of Mecca. And these three sister idols were are called Alat, Al Uzza, and Al Manat. These are names that the Arabs came up with, and they referred to these three uh, uh, idols as the daughters of God. So these are three outlying um, you know, settlements outside of Mecca. So you have Hubal in the uh, middle, and you have these outlying kind of surrounding daughters of God spread around their uh, chief idol. Now, we know this for a fact because these three names are mentioned in the Quran. In Surah Al-Najm, Allah asks, you know, incredulously, He says, Have you seen Allah and Al-Uzza and the third one named Manath? What? For you, you prefer males as sons, but then you assign females to God for children? That's hardly a fair deal. So Allah is saying, you're the ones who are burying your daughters, and yet you're inventing this thing that God has children. And on top of that, you're saying that he has daughters, even though you don't want daughters for yourself. And then Allah continues, in fact, they're nothing more than names that you've made up and you and your ancestors. God sent down no permission for you to do that. They're only following their own opinions and what they fo themselves foolishly desire. And so it is the guidance that has come now to them from their Lord. So take a listen to this from Surah Al-Najm and listen for those names. Al-Lat, Al-Uzza, and Al-Manat. Asma'un 
سميتموها سميتموها أنتم وآباؤكم ما ما أنزل الله بها من سلطان إن يتبعون إلا الظن وما تهوى الأنفس ولقد جاءهم من ربهم الهدى. So the Meccans' chief rivals was the Bani Thaqif, another tribe, just like you have the Quraysh, you have the Thaqif. And the Thaqif lived in a city called Ta'if. Ta'if is um, I, it may be about an hour, two hours away from Mecca to the east. It's a little bit higher in elevation, uh, a little bit more uh, of an agricultural place. They have more water and so forth. And these people were very proud of their own city, and they wanted to rival the Meccans. They were, their um, chief idol was Alat, one of the daughters. And so they had this rivalry with the Meccans. But just to paint the picture, the Meccans kind of always felt that they were better than everyone else. They were the trading center. Everyone came through Mecca, and they weren't as bothered by the outlying um, rivals because they just felt like, look, we have the head god, we have the commercial hub, everyone is welcome to come to us. We don't discriminate between idols, We're wel- we will welcome everyone's idol into our place. And so if you think about it that way, the Meccans were very uh, big on accepting new practices, new idolatry, and so forth, because... If visiting pilgrims knew that their local idol was also included in the pantheon of the Kaaba, <clears throat> it's kind of like saying, oh, we're welcome here also. So the Meccans are very open about having all beliefs come. You know, it's something we see even nowadays where, you know, the more opening and welcome you are, the less you annoy people and the more people will actually, you know, come to your business. And so that's what the Meccans are doing right now is that they're just welcoming anything and everything, every possible belief, because at the end of the day, it boosts the economy. So that's what we're seeing here in figure P13, which you can see on uh, page 62, you'll see a map of Mecca with the surrounding cities, Ta'if, Nakhla, and Khudayd. These are three cities or settlements, and they all have their three idols, Allah, Al-Uzza, and Al-Manath, which are mentioned in the Quran. So that's just a brief overview of paganism. We're going to now move on to Zoroastrianism. Now, Zoroastrianism, while they're you may not know many people who follow this practice now. This was a very big religion at that time and previously. Zoroastrianism was the dominant religion of Persian of the Persian Empire. It was founded by a prophet, Zarathustra. And this is in the 10th or 11th century BCE. So again, to put it in context, perhaps a little bit before uh, the coming of Dawud and Suleiman You know, it's again, very hard to date these things perfectly, but sometime way back then. A man by the name of Zarathustra came to Persia and he was preaching about good and evil. And again, in my humble opinion, um, it is very possible that this could have been a prophet sent to the Persians. And his teaching was then, um, you know, uh, changed and shaped and um, recalibrated over time so that it didn't represent the original teachings of Zarathustra, just like uh, we believe Christianity doesn't necessarily teach, uh, represent the original teachings of Isa alayhi salam. So Zoroastrianism uh, began as a very monotheistic religion, but it subsequently developed into this very dualistic kind of yin-yang, good versus evil type religion with kind of sub-deities and so forth in it. And while the vast majority of Persia was Zoroastrian, one thing that it provided is it provided a haven for a lot of Jews and persecuted Christians. So a lot of these persecuted Christians were Nestorian Christians, and we'll talk about why they were persecuted Christians in the first place. But something to just keep in mind is that Persia, right? So we're talking about kind of the places of Iraq and current day Iran and moving east, that Persian empire, mostly Zoroastrian, it it, it, it was a haven for kind of unorthodox beliefs also uh, of people who were fleeing from Western places like the Roman Empire. So again, that's a very quick overview of that. But And also, if you have the book, page 63, figure P14 is a very clear map. It's one of the best maps, I think, in the book because it shows you the geopolitical and the religious beliefs all on one page. You'll see where the Christians, the Jews, and the Zoroastrians lived, where the idols were also, and so forth. Let's move on to Judaism. So Judaism, we trace back to 
Abraham, peace be upon him. And, you know, we kind of went through the line of Abraham and uh, Isaac and Ismail, but just as a quick review, we said that we had the pre-flood prophets who were the major ones were Adam, uh, Idris, alayhi salam, and Nuh, alayhi salam. And after that, we have the kind of the post-flood prophet, and the major one is Ibrahim, alayhi salam. Ibrahim, alayhi salam, has two main children that we know of. Know of. They're other children, but they're two main children. And those two branches are the branch of Ishaq and Ismail alayhi salam. Almost all the prophets were sent to the line of Ishaq. Why? Because they were the chosen people. Allah said that I have chosen this nation and he has made a covenant with them. So when you make a covenant with somebody, it's basically saying, look, I have a contract with you. I'm making a contract that I'm going to take care of you, but I will keep taking care of you as long as you you know, pay the bill. And so that's what Allah did is he sent messenger after messenger after messenger after messenger. So who were these messengers? Well, we have Ishaq was a prophet. His son, Yaqub was a prophet. Yaqub's son, Yusuf Islam, was a prophet. So you had four prophets in a row. I don't know any other time that we actually know that you had four generations in a row where each father gave birth to a son who was a prophet, gave birth to a son, gave birth to a son who was a prophet. So that is the line of Bani Israel. And remember, we call it Bani Israel because another name for Yaqub is Israel. So this is the descendants of uh, Israel. And a lot of the prophets that we know of mentioned in the Quran are from this line. So we have, and I'll use the English terms, Moses, Aaron, we have Job, and Jethro, Ayyub, David, Solomon, Elijah, Elisha, Jonah, Ezekiel, Zechariah, John, and of course, Jesus, Isa alayhi salam, uh, and his mother, Mary. So all of the prophets, so many of the prophets were sent to these people because they had a covenant with Allah. But as we will see in the uh, Medina and surahs, mostly, they abused this covenant. And not only did they not listen to what the messengers were saying, many of them they killed because they wanted to suppress the truth of what they were bringing because they were reminding these people to come back to Allah. So what you see on the left side of the page is a people who are getting messages. They're getting system updates over and over and over and over again. But they keep denying the system update. They keep refusing to install the update, to be reminded by the update. If anything, they are killing the messengers who are sending them the reminders. Meanwhile, on the right side of the sheet, the children of Ismail Islam, they're not getting any reminders. They had that first reminder with Ibrahim and Ismail Islam. They had the Kaaba that was built, just like you had the Temple of Solomon that was built on the left side. You have the Kaaba that's built on the right side. And for over 2,000 years, there's no reminder. There's no prophets coming to uh, the Arabian Peninsula. There's nothing. And so they are free to slowly wander and slowly fall away from monotheism. And that's exactly what you see in Mecca with the Quraysh. They start bringing the idols in and they're slowly wandering away. They're vestiges of Abrahamic faith in their practice. They're still performing the Hajj and the Tawaf, but they're doing their Tawaf naked. So it's like the, you know, it's a great example of like, yeah, they're doing the right action, but it's completely wrong at the same time. And that's what happened to the other side. So they did not have a covenant but they just drifted away slowly and slowly and slowly until, of course, the final messenger comes, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after Allah has given the, the left side of the page chance after chance after chance. It's like, you know what? You've used up all your chances now. And the last prophet on the la left side of the page, Isa alayhi salam said, Ya Bani Israel, indeed I am the messenger of Allah to you, confirming what came before me of the Torah and bringing good news of a messenger to come after me whose name is Ahmad. But when he came to them with clear evidences, they said, this is obvious magic. وَإِذْ قَالَ عِيسَى بْنُ مَرْيَمَ يَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ مُصَدِّقًا مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا بَيْنَ يَدَيَّ مِنَ التَّوْرَاةِ وَمُبَشِّرًا بِرَسُولٍ يَأْتِي ومبشرا برسول يأتي من بعد اسمه أحمد فلما جاءهم بالبينات قالوا هذا سحر مبين
مبين. And so this is the irony of the story here, is that the line on the right side of the page, the people on the right side who didn't have a message for so long, they get the final messenger who clarifies everything that came before, who sets straight everything, the stories of the prophets, the real truth of what happened on the left side of the page. And he is the one who eventually brings us back to the way of Ibrahim al-Islam who was at the top of the page. So this is why I always say this religion is the deen of Ibrahim al-Islam and everything downstream of it on the left side of the page and the right side of the page. We're talking about Bani Israel on the left and Bani Ismail on the right. Everything downstream is just attempts to either get away from the Abrahamic message or in the case of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, an attempt to come back to the Abrahamic message. So that is kind of just a, a rough overview of the history of the Jews. Now the Jews, we know, are referred to as Bani Israel. And Bani Israel means the tribe of Israel, which broke into 12 sub-tribes. So Jacob had 12 sons, which we know about, also mentioned in the Quran. His youngest ones were Yusuf, alayhi salam, and Benjamin. And these people spread all all throughout Canaan. And each tribe had its own um, kind of area that they were responsible for. How do we know this? Well, we see in Surah Al-A'raf, Allah says, and we divided them into 12 descendant tribes. And we inspired Moses when his people implored him for water. Strike with your staff the stone and there gushed forth from it 12 springs. Every people knew its watering place. And we shaded them with clouds and we sent upon them manna and quail saying, eat from the good things which we have provided for you. And they wronged us not but they were only wronging themselves. what happened for uh, with the Jews and this is again very quick overview is they experienced a number of successive uh, diasporas or another a number of successive times where they were forced out of the land and they had to spread out throughout uh, kind of the known world. The most recent one of those is the Roman occupation of Jerusalem in 70 common era. So this is after Isa alayhi salam when the Romans came, occupied uh, Jerusalem and they forced a number of Jewish tribes to seek refuge in the Arabian Peninsula. So the Jews couldn't stay there. They had overstayed their welcome. They're forced out by the Romans. Many Jews went to different parts of the world, but a lot of them were forced into Arabia. And I'm talking about Arabia particularly because that's the topic of this chapter is what was happening in Arabia. So a lot of Jews settled in Arabia in different places. One of those places was a place called Khaybar, which will come up prominently in the uh, later part of this book. Another place where Jews settled was in a village called Yathrib. So a lot of Jews came and settled in Yathrib. And that's how the Jews came to settle in these areas and become Arabized because they are taking on Arabic and taking on Arab customs. And so what you see in these Jewish enclaves is a kind of a religious identity which is unique in that it is uniquely Jewish, but at the same time, they too were starting to pick up some of the Arab traditions and uh, Arab uh, pagan practices and so forth. So you have this melding of ideas uh, and so forth, superstition, black magic, all that kind of stuff was also being absorbed into the local Jewish enclaves that had settled into Arabia. So we have now covered paganism, Zoroastrianism, and Judaism as they exist in 7th century Arabia. Uh, we're going to end this episode here so that we don't make it too long. In the next episodes, we're going to finish up religions in and around Mecca by talking about Christianity and how after that, we're going to go into some of the political empires that surround Arabia before we begin the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So if this was helpful for you, feel free to share, uh, like, and subscribe to this. And I can't wait to see you guys in the next episode. We've got some more interesting conversations to be had about Christianity. I will see you guys soon. Assalamu alaikum. 
إن الذين قالوا ربنا الله ثم استقاموا فلا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون أولئك أصحاب الجنة خالدين فيها خالدين فيها جزاء بما كانوا يعملون